Well, open your Bibles today to Romans chapter 8, the book of Romans, the 8th chapter. Looking at a couple of references in Romans, and then we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Stand together for the reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 8. God has been speaking to us from Romans 8, verses 16 and 17. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And the Lord is reminding us here that suffering is part of our Christian life. And before we are glorified with Christ, we must also suffer along with him. So all of us, in one way or another, are going to experience a measure, measure of suffering. And the Apostle Paul then goes on to describe that. So we don't lose our confidence, lose our faith, lose our trust in God. He says, here's how I intend to help you. God intends to help us in our sufferings. Among the many, many things he describes here, we come to verse 28. The great, uh, great Christian, Christian text And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That special gem in the context, he says that all our sufferings, God uses them, God causes them to work together for what? For good. For everybody? No, for those that love God. For those that love God, for those that are called according to his purpose, for God's children, the ones that he just testified in chapter 8, verse 16, we are children of God. For you, God causes all things to work together for good. We saw last Sunday morning that he causes our difficulties, past and present, our difficulties, past and present, to work together for good. This morning, we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. How God causes our weaknesses to work together for good. Chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul writes this testimony. He says, boasting is necessary, although it is not profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know or Or out of body, I do not know, God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from this, so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, To keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Our Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, I suppose this this text applies to all of us here. We all are beset with 
many, many weaknesses. And we understand how you can take our weaknesses and make them work together for good for your children. So show us now from the life of Paul. Explain to us from the life of Paul how you can take our weaknesses, our sicknesses, our disabilities, all the things that hold us back in life, all our difficulties, and how they can work together for your glory and our good. We ask it for your sake, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, last week, Joseph, Joseph taught us how we can respond to difficulties in the past and in the present when things don't go the way they ought to go. We're asking the Apostle Paul now to help us understand our weaknesses. That means our sicknesses. When we, uh, are, when we receive the news that somehow we have an illness or we uh, encounter an illness, or you have a, di- a disability that perhaps you received from birth or along the way, a disability came your way, and you're asking God, God, why me? Or is it perhaps that in your personal life you sense, you sense a certain inadequacy, that somehow in yourself you feel that there is a great amount of inadequacy of which you have no answer for, And you're asking, God, uh, what about my inadequacies? What about my disabilities? What about my weaknesses? What about them? And God has an answer for us. He has an answer for us. It goes back to Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good, even even these things. Now, Now, the Apostle Paul says, we know, we know. And the only way Romans 8, 28 can apply to your life is that you need to know. You need to know what is stating here. You need to know, first of all, that God is good. That God will never do anything to you or anything that will come your way that doesn't come from his absolute goodness. Now, he can't say that. He can't say that for the wicked. The wicked are dealing with God's justice and God's righteousness. But God's people are always dealing with God's goodness. And so God is always going to be good to you. Understand also that God is almighty that nothing is impossible with God. And so that God then can take, because of his goodness and his almightiness, can take whatever happens to you, and because he's good and because he's almighty, can take these things and work them out for your good. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. This is not fate. This is not simply a process. This is God working in your life and my life to cause all things to work together for good to those that love God. And so you need to know that. And the Apostle Paul here in his testimony recounts that, reminds us of that. That God is there for our weaknesses, for our illnesses, for our disabilities, for inadequacies. And I suppose every one of us here in some ways fit in one of these categories. Uh, There are some, some exceptions to this, but but eventually you'll make the list as well. And, and, and the source of these weaknesses, they, they, uh, they come from all different sources. Obviously, the Apostle Paul reminded us that we live in a fallen world. Some are natural. We live in a fallen world. Imperfections are natural to this world. The curse brought about death, and the curse brought about imperfections. That nothing out there is absolutely perfect. Beautiful, yes, but not perfect. And that includes our lives. So we are many, we are all of us, all of us have in some ways some manner of imperfections in our life. Sometimes our weaknesses, our illnesses and issues, disabilities come as a result of sin. Sin comes in and God warned the Israelites. He says, you need to follow my commandments and follow my laws and obey my word. Otherwise, All the diseases I placed on the Egyptians, I'm going to place upon you. And so the result of sin oftentimes are these weaknesses and these disabilities. Take take a lesson from Samson. Samson was blind. They gouged his eyes out. Not because he was, was a righteous man, but because he was what? He was a sinner, rebelled against God, and God gouged his eyes out. And yet God was able to take even his blindness... 
And in his life, turn it out for the glory of God and for the good of Samson. And so we, we see that sometimes, sometimes it's God's election. Why was I born with this disability? Why was I born with this particular problem? Well, friends, sometimes God just elects this to happen for his own glory. You recall in John chapter 9, as they're walking down, they see this blind man who's blind from birth. And the disciples ask Jesus, Jesus, who sinned? His parents or did he sin that he was born blind? And Jesus says, neither his parents sin, nor did he sin. This is not a matter of sin, gentlemen. This is a matter of the glory of God. And that God allowed him to be born blind for such a time as this, for the glory of God. And there are times when certain illnesses and certain issues that come into our life are the result of Satan's direct attack upon our lives. We see that here in Paul's case, we saw that earlier in Job's case, there are elect special cases where God allows Satan to inflict harm and weaknesses and, and illnesses upon certain people, but that's between God and Satan, and you and, I are, you and I are not always privileged to that. In Job's case, he was. In Paul's case, he also was. And so there are times like this, but always sets, God always sets limits. Satan doesn't have full reign upon our lives. Now, from Paul's testimony, and we could all give testimony as well, the effects of our weaknesses are, are great. We never want to minimize sickness, never want to minimize disabilities, never want to minimize inadequacies. Paul says, they, this, uh, this thorn in the flesh was given to me to torment me. It tormented me. It was a physical, emotional torment, painful. And you and that have these disabilities know what I'm talking about. Paul said it was unrelenting. It didn't stop. It didn't stop. No matter what I did, it didn't stop. It just kept on, kept on, and kept on. There's no relief, no cure, no removal. And sometimes in our diseases, in our sicknesses, in our disabilities, there is no cure. There is no physical relief of our problem. And that is a given. It can also be very debilitating. It can hinder us. If we allow it, it can hinder us from accomplishing the purpose God has for us. And it holds us back. And how many people do we know like that, that are being held back by their, uh, their weaknesses, whatever category they fall under? But I want us to see from Paul's life that God can take these weaknesses and work them out for our good. Paul is an example of Romans 8, 28. And I'd like us to look at that, look at Paul's life. Because those of us here, all of us here, that are in this category, you have sicknesses, you have diseases, you know someone that might have these diseases. You have disabilities that you were born with or that came along life's journey. Or you have overwhelming inadequacies about your life. What can you do about them? And Paul says, look at my life. Look at my life, and I want my life to be an example to you. That's why you wrote it, as an example of how God, God can take our weaknesses and work them out for our good. He becomes an example. He could stand before you here and give you his example. He's given us an example here in chapter 12. He did it also in chapter 11. And he says, here is what the Lord taught me. First of all, his weaknesses humbled him. Humbled him. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, for this reason, to keep me from what? Exalting myself. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from what? Exalting myself. It humbled him. Now, see, Paul had an, an unusual experience one of a kind. And he says, I don't know how it happened, whether it was an ecstasy, whether it was just a mind where God opened my mind to see glory, to see paradise, or whether he literally took me into heaven itself, into the third heaven, which is paradise itself, where, where, all, where Christ is, where God is, where the saints are. He says, I went there, and I can't, there, the, my experience is inexpressible. I, I can't talk about it. But it was one of a kind. 
But he said, to keep me from exalting myself, God gave me this God-ordained weakness. That's why. It, it was designed to humble me. To humble me. Now, you know. You know what happens when you have, you have success. All of us know what happens when we have success. When somehow we have an above, above the norm. When your, when your abilities are above the norm, when your looks are above the norm, when your talent is above the norm, when your success is above the norm, you know what happens to you. And that's why last Sunday night we spoke about that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Remember that? That pride can make us stumble and pride can also destroy us. Well, God would not have Paul fall in that category. Paul was too special a servant for God, too special a man to lose to the sin of pride. So to keep him from exalting himself, he sent him this weakness. That's his testimony. By the way, you notice twice he says that in one verse. To keep me from exalting myself, to keep me from exalting myself, he bookends the whole experience. The whole experience. That should make us careful about trying to be too successful. Don't you think so? But nevertheless, he says this. And it's interesting that, that throughout the Bible, weaknesses are always God's refining element. All of God's servants that achieved any type of success, they all had some refining element. Abraham, the father of the, the, father of the faithful, didn't begin his success until he was an old man. He was a super pathfinder. That's how old he was. <laughs> it wasn't until then that he began to be the father of the faithful. He was 100. His wife was pushing 90, over 90. And yet that's when they had their first child that was to be the, the father of many nations. Jacob walked with a limp, dislocated hip. And that's throughout his life, he walked with a limp. A reminder again that although you're the father of a great nation, yet you will have a weakness about you. We also saw how Joseph spent his time as a slave. Moses never made it into the promised land. Moses, was, Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness in rejection. We read on and we see that many of others, Samson was blind, Gideon was weak, Rahab was a was a harlot in her background, and on and on and on. All the heroes of, uh, heroes of Hebrews 11, they all had some measure of weakness. All great people are given some weakness to keep them from exalting themselves. And so it is that God sends a refining element to Paul. He says, Paul, to keep you from exalting yourself because of what I allowed you to see, you're going to have this weakness about you. And so it is. So it is, the higher you climb, that you can expect God to send some refining, refining elements into your life. Always to keep us humble. Always to keep us humble. Notice also verse 8. Paul also learned, it, it, it made him pray more. Okay, verse 8. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Now, that little short verse is pregnant with this whole idea that it made Paul pray. Now, friend, Paul always prayed. Paul was a praying man. All his testimony and all his epistles, he's always praying. But somehow, his prayer life improved as a result of this weakness. It made him pray more. Made him pray more. He said, now, concerning this, the word this goes back to Satan's messenger. Satan is the messenger. Concerning this particular problem, the fact that this was not, an, this is not a usual disease, this was not a usual problem. By the way, we don't know what this was. The storm in the flesh, we have no idea what it was. Some say it was a blindness that, that he had. He had, he had a, a, a vision problem. It, it may be that he had a, a problem with, with his legs, uh, illness of some type. We don't know what it is. Now, he wasn't married, so it wasn't his wife, Okay. <laughs> So lay that one to rest, all right? But what he does say, the source of my weakness, the source of my disease, this thorn in the flesh, is not natural. 
It's not sin. It's satanic. And so I had to turn to God. I turned to God. You see, friends, there are certain problems that you and I cannot resolve. There are certain issues that come into our life that we, there's no place else to turn but to turn to where? To God. And that's our problem today is that we have so many of our American citizens and even among believers that we don't turn to God in our weaknesses. We turn to other stuff. We have a huge drug, drug epidemic because we're not turning to God. We have all these people turning to quacks to resolve their problems, whether they are medical quacks or psychological quacks, to resolve their problems, and they will never resolve their problems. We have people becoming overly overwhelmed with depression because they just do not turn to God. And Paul says, this made me turn to God. I turned to God for this because there's no way that I could ever resolve this problem. And then he said, I implored the Lord. I implored. That is a very unusual word. When Paul talks about prayer, he uses a number of different words for prayer. But this word is an unusual word. To implore the Lord is to beg the Lord. I'm exhorting the Lord is the word. I exhorted the Lord. I went and approached the throne of grace and I appealed to God. I appealed to God. It's almost the same expression that James says about Elijah, a f- fervent prayer. You know, there's prayer and then there's fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. I was praying with a Hispanic pastor years ago, and I was, I was caught off guard because he was leading us in prayer, and he began to pray like this. Mira, Señor, mira Dios. And I, I had to stop and look at him. He was saying, look, God, listen, God. And imploring God. You see, there are times when, when you're overwhelmed with your problems and your difficulties and your weaknesses and your diseases, you need to, you need to pray fervently. Amen. You need to pray fervently. And Paul prayed fervently. I implored the Lord. I implored him how many times? Three times. And by the word three doesn't mean like one, two, three. The, the idea of three means I, I kept on unceasing prayer, unceasing prayer. I prayed the same thing again and again and again, just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed the same prayer three different times in earnestness. And so he prayed with earnestness, unceasing, beseeching God. Like the, like the Lord taught us in Luke chapter 18, that we had, we had always to pray and never to give up. Christians never give up on praying. We never close a book. We never just get up and say, you know, God, I've had it. We never do that. You see, even in our, even in our deepest problems, this sickness made Paul pray even more earnestly. And friend, sometimes that will do to you. Your weaknesses, your disabilities, your diseases will make you a praying person. You didn't pray before, now you pray. Never turned to God before, now we do. Now we do. And so this is good for us, isn't it? That God causes all things to work together for what? Is praying good? Oh, absolutely. Praying is probably the best of all things. And so he prayed. He prayed. He made Paul pray. Now look at verse 9. It said that also it, it empowered him. And he said to me, and the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Let me ask you, did God answer his prayer? Uh, I'm asking you one more time. Did God answer his prayer? Listen, friends, God always answers the prayers of his children. He always does. Now, he doesn't answer the prayer of the godless person. The Bible says that when when the unrighteous prays, it is an abomination to God. Because he's presuming upon God. But God always hears the prayers 
of God's children. His ears are always attuned to you. It's like a mother and an infant, always listening, always listening. And so it is that whenever God's children pray, God hears. God hears your prayers, and he answers your prayers. Now, he doesn't answer what you ask for. It's always something, what, better. Yeah, something better. Cut you off guard, didn't it? Better. He doesn't, doesn't give you what you ask for, but he gives you something better in its place. And so Paul says, listen, so he said, and so he said to me, he said to me. Now, it's interesting that the word he, he, has, he has said to me, he has said to me of you. You know, we can watch television old school, black and white. Or we can watch television old school, just color television. Or you can watch television high definition. I mean, like really high definition. Where you, you can see like, the, you can see the hair on the guy's face. You can see the, the dimple or the pimple on the gal's face. You know what I'm saying? And when you read, when you read the text here, high definition, the word, and he said, the Greek, the Greek puts a perfect tense here, which means I said it, it's firm, it'll always be there for you. I'm saying it to you, Paul, it is firm. And it'll always be there for you no matter what happens. That's what it says here. So it's when he said, and so God said to me, answered my prayer by giving me this great promise that will always be true. It will always be true. That's what it says here. High definition. He says two things to him. First of all, he says what? My what? Grace is what? Sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. And no matter your weaknesses, no matter your disabilities, no matter whatever happens to you physically, whatever inadequacies you're born with or you develop along the way or you have, he says, my grace will always be sufficient for you. Whatever, whatever I've taken away from you, whatever I've removed from you, either natural or by express purposes, uh, in its place, I've placed an abundance of grace. I've made up for it by my grace. And grace is God's ability. Grace is, uh, grace is unmerited. Grace is undeserved. Grace is free. Grace is free, and grace is always sufficient. Like it'll always, it'll always be there for you. You'll always have more than enough. Whatever was lacking in, in the afflictions that God sent to the Apostle Paul, this thorn in the flesh, this debilitating torment, all of that, he says, God says, listen, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. I have enough for you. It's there. You're not really disabled. You're not really inadequate. This disease is not going to set you back. My grace is sufficient for you. I don't need to remove it, Paul, because you have an abundance of grace. Now, that is a mouthful, people. Is it not? That is a mouthful. That grace is sufficient for you. That's what he's saying. And then he adds something else. Not only is my grace sufficient for you, but he says also that, that God, that power is perfected in what? In weakness. That power is perfected in weaknesses. Interesting. And that's why we, we want that in life. We want to have ability. We want to have potential. We want to have power. We want to be able to do all that God wants us to do. Does, does, isn't that... Isn't that and he said, listen, Paul, the way, the way you have it, the equation, the way that you see power is not the way I see power. The way you see ability is not the way I see ability. The way you think of developing strength in your life is not the way I look at developing strength in your life. My approach is this way, Paul, that through weaknesses, power is perfected. Hmm? That your power is perfected by means of weaknesses. This is an incredible truth, people. This is, this is like goes all against anything we'd ever think about. 
unless you stop and examine it, and it's so true. He says that it teaches us, when you look at your weaknesses, it teaches you to depend upon God's power. See, our problem, people, is that we are all, by nature, we become self-sufficient. We depend upon our own strength and our own abilities. Isn't that true? That's our problem. We, we don't need God. And we, we see America drifting away from God. You ever notice that? More and more drifting away from God. We're debating now removing the cross from a monument back east. Some mo- a cross on a monument, someone's debating removing that. We have to, we're having to take that to the Supreme Court. What's that about? Like, where is God in this whole picture? Well, we don't need God anymore. We don't need God. Americans are self-sufficient, really. Look at you. Crippled in every respect. Hmm? Do we need God or do we not? We need God. We need God. And God says, this is, this is why I send you weaknesses. Why I send you, I send you these things. To teach you dependence upon God. To know that whatever strength, whatever power you need... Only comes from me. And that's an old, ancient, ancient truth. Do not trust in horses. Back in the Psalms, remember that? Do not trust in horses. Do not trust in chariots. Trust in God. Yeah. Don't trust in your, in your, in, in your great armies. No, he says you trust in God. In God we trust. In God we trust. You see, he power is perfected in weaknesses. And if by any chance you're moving in that direction, if somehow I don't need God anymore, I don't need this, and I don't need that, I don't need to depend upon God, then, friend, um, I got news for you. If you're a child of God, you can expect there to be a visitation. A messenger of Satan will come and visit you someplace, somewhere, and give you a thorn in the what? flesh and that may be your wife that may be your husband that may be any any number of things that will turn you to God and now you depend upon God God will do anything I've told parents many times when their kids are rebellious and their kids are godless I said pray an imprecatory prayer stop and say God look at my son raised in church raised in a one and out there living like like the devil Lord do something with him. Lord, send him a smiting disease. Cripple him. Get him fired from his job. Let his girlfriend betray him and go with some other animal. Lord, visit him with some affliction. Pray that prayer, record it, and send it to him. <laughs> Does, God answer prayer? Does God answer the prayer of a righteous mother? Every single time. You say, is that biblical? It is. Read the Psalms. It is. See, people need that. People need. And God, God says power is perfected in weaknesses. Your weaknesses also draw out. They draw out the strength that is already in us. We already have a measure of strength. We just don't, we just don't utilize it. But our weaknesses, our, our disabilities... Our inadequacies make us face these things and makes us do something with them. They're good for us. They do. They affect our lives so that we're able then to take hold of ourselves and do the best we can with what God has given us. You know, uh, Rick, Rick Salas, uh, you, you might enjoy this one. Uh, uh, Rick, just, he, Rick, Rick runs the marathon. Did you run it last Saturday? He, he ran it last Saturday. What was your time last Saturday? Eight hours and 45, two days. Yeah, no. No, no, he's... Friend, don't laugh. How far have you run? You know, it took you five weeks to get here this morning. See? But, but Rick, I read about this man's blind, blind. He ran the half marathon in two hours and 20 minutes. Half marathon. Blind, people. Blind. What's your excuse? See, in other words, there's, there's strength in us. There's strength in us. 
And our inadequacies, our weaknesses, our diseases, our sicknesses, just make us draw deep and utilize the strength that's already there that God has given us. Yes or no? And not sit around and be crybabies and give up on life. Hmm? Just because I'm blind, I can't do anything. This man ran the marathon in two hours and 20 minutes. See, power is perfected in weaknesses. Our weaknesses gradually make us stronger and stronger and stronger through God's help. Our weaknesses raise the threshold of pain. They raise it and raise it and raise it. It's amazing, but it does. And so God wants us to be strong. We have a battle to fight. We have a life to live. We have the glory of God to display. And it can't be done by weak people. It can't be done by those that throw in the towel every time they hit a wall. It's got to be done by stronger people. And so God prepares strong people by giving them these kinds of issues and these kinds of problems. All designed to increase our faith. Power is perfected in weaknesses. And so the reason why you have what you have today is that God is building a strong person in you. The reason why you're born with these disabilities or have these inadequacies is because, you see, look beyond that and God is going to perfect, perfect power through your weaknesses. So look at that. And God says, so you see, God causes all things to work together for what? Good. Now look at, look at verse 9. He says, furthermore, he says, here's what, here's what it did to me. It made me, he said, Paul says, it made me glory in my weaknesses. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast or glory about my what? Weaknesses. So that the power of God may dwell in what? Me. See, you read through the whole New Testament. Paul never talks about the, the paradise. Read about all the New Testament. God never talks about how God raptured him into heaven and he saw inexpressible things. Never do you read about that. This is all you see right here. And he's not boasting about that. He's boasting about his weaknesses. Not about the vision. It's his weaknesses. He says, it made me glory in my weaknesses. Why? Because he saw the love of God in his weaknesses. He saw that this is what God had for him. That God loved him. That God loved him. And so he learned to thank God. He learned to thank God. He wasn't mad. He wasn't angry at God. Isn't it sad that such a gifted person like Steve Dawson, this great, great scientist, who had this horrendous disability would end up hating God and spend his entire life proving the non-existence of God instead of stopping to thank God that in, in spite of the disability he had such an unusual gift that could have been used for the glory of God but instead and so if we turn and become angry at God and upset and depressed because of our disabilities or our sicknesses or inadequacies, we're missing it all. We're missing it. Paul says, no, I, I can see God loving me even in my weaknesses, especially in my weaknesses. I can see the love of God for me. And that's why he says, so I, I, I'm, I'm glad, I'm I'm glad that good came out of my weaknesses. I'm good. I'm, I'm happy. I'm most gladly, therefore, I'd rather boast because, because I can see that in my weaknesses, the power of God is going to dwell in me. He says, that's what happens. Now, he uses an expression, the word dwell is the word for tabernacle, to overshadow somebody. 
And he's taking, he's taking a picture back to the Old Testament that when God took Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, God overshadowed them. God was in their midst every step of the way. All By day, there was a bright uh, cloud. By night, there was a bright, bright light shining. God tabernacled among them. So in my weaknesses, God is there. God tabernacles with me. He's there for me. And so most gladly, therefore, I will boast about my weaknesses. Because then when God dwells in me, the power of God is going to be there for me. What a, what a testimony. Look at verse 10. He says the result of this, that God causes all things to work together for good, is that I live a highly contented life. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with persecution, with difficulties, with with. with, with this, with insults, distresses, persecutions, and difficulties for Christ's sake. Because when I'm weak, then what? I'm strong. Content. Was Paul a happy camper? Yeah. He was, he was happy. Content. Content. Was there a thorn in his flesh? Yeah. It's there. It was there. But, you know, it didn't make him bitter. It didn't make him sour. It didn't make him mean. Didn't make him gross. Didn't make him mean spirited. Wasn't walking around with a cloud over his head. He says, I'm well content. I'm well content with all that I have. I'm all that I have. Because you see, my weaknesses have given me my strength. And so he ends by saying, I can look beyond. I I can look beyond. Look at verse 10. See, he goes beyond weaknesses. I am well content with what? With weaknesses. But then he adds to the grocery list and with insults and with distresses and with persecutions and with difficulties for Christ's sake. (laughs) He says he looks beyond that. All the stuff that because of, of this that God has taught me that in my weaknesses, in my sicknesses, in my disabilities... All this has made me a stronger person, a better person. I'm content with that, and I can take my life and live it to the fullness for the glory of God. He looked beyond, looked beyond. Friends, are you aware, are you aware that this man, Paul, that next to Jesus Christ, he is the greatest human being that ever lived? Are you aware of that? That next to the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no other human being that has had a greater impact upon this world than the Apostle Paul. Why? Because he was able to look beyond, see, beyond his weaknesses, beyond his problems, and live for the glory of God, well content. Well content. Now, You may be saying beneath your breath, yeah, easy for you to say, Montoya. <laughs> easy for you to say. You have no disabilities. You have no illnesses. I mean, look at me. And you know, friend, I suppose you're right. Maybe you are right. But I'm not asking you to compare yourself to me. I'm asking you to compare yourself to Paul. Hmm? Learn from him, right? And then see what good God is trying to accomplish in your life as a result of that. Yes or no? Yeah. See what perspective is. God can cause all things to work together for good. To those that love God. Uh, I want you to be honest with me now this morning. Anybody here have a, a sickness or a disability or an inadequacy that you've been wrestling now for most of your life? Would you raise your hand and just be honest? Okay. Yeah. A lot of us, huh? A lot of us. Which is most of us. Isn't that great? Now we know why. 
<laughs> now we know why. Wow. Now we know why. You know, now you know why it all works out the way it should be, for all for the glory of God. Our good and the glory of God. That's what it is. So look for that. And let that be what governs your life and changes your life and makes you a, a sweet person, a contented person, a contented person. I was preaching in Temecula a few weeks ago, and I walked in, and wow, there was a, another guy there with a birthmark on his forehead. <laughs> I said, whoa. I finally found you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Maybe to you it's nothing. For me it was an, a disability. You go through life like that. I've been blind for a long time. I've been blind for a long time. It's a disability. They can work with it, but it's still there. I shouldn't be preaching. I shouldn't be preaching because there's a high degree of inadequacy. But see, it doesn't matter because God takes weaknesses and you have to depend upon him. Yes or no? Yeah. And so God can cause all things to work together for what? And then I have the toughest job in the world to pastor you. No, no, not really. Not really. You're a joy. Most of you are joy. You're a joy. <laughs> Romans 8, 28. For we know. Finish it. God causes all things. Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat? If you're going, you need to go back and look at that verse, all right? And make that your verse. Next Sunday, we're going to see another way that God uses something else for our good. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for speaking to us. For reminding